Welcome to Dennis Harlock Studio Furniture. I'm Dennis. I'm here today with CNC Labs and we're, today we're going to talk about a couple of things that are people are having a hard time finding on the internet. So I'm going to try to address a couple of those things like chip load, exit angle of tools, knife marks per inch, that sort of thing. One of the things about cutting wood that we need to understand is that wood is actually an elastic solid. I've just got a, 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 an elastic band around this piece of oak. So as the cutting action happens with the wood, the tool itself is actually going to be stretching the wood fibers. Now the, the cells are held together with lignin which is like a, a, a glue for the wood. When, we're, when this happens, how much the cells um, actually stretch depends on the sharpness of your tool, the species of wood, because not all wood has the same amount of cells in it. Some of them are shorter and some of them are longer. So as wood is being cut, it's actually stretching before it's actually cut. So, and that's the same thing that happens with your tools as each cutting knife goes around and tries to cut the material. We have that slight stretching before it actually makes the cut. All right, now we're gonna talk about chip load. If you come from the metal industry, chip load happens all the time. Everything is calculated on chip load. There's tons of information out there about chip load. When it comes to the woodworking information, there's very little. There's formulas that will, will show you but nobody actually knows or has a hard time understanding where the chip load numbers come from. I'll be telling you what the standard chip load should be for woodworking. And the problem with woodworking is that as opposed to the metal side, any given piece of metal will react very similar from one piece of metal to the other as long as it's from the same grade. As you know, a piece of wood could vary from one end to the other. So feed speeds and chip load may vary. Okay, so what I'll be telling you today are just guidelines. Chip load. What it's referred to as the mean thickness of a chip that is created during the cutting process. Now you have to understand, when we have a tool spinning and we're moving linear, the chip is not a consistent thickness. If you had a hand plane and you were planing a piece of wood, generally from one end to the other of that chip will be the same thickness. Because of the cutting action, the tool going circular, the feed being linear, we will end up with a chip that is shaped something like this. The mean thickness would be, we've got the thinnest, we've got the thickest, and it will be the middle point, okay? So that, this thickness here is what we're trying to achieve. Some of this depends on the, the length of the chip depends on the type of tool you're using and the number of uh, teeth that are actually cutting the material. So this is the important factor that we want is the mean chip thickness. Now, why chip load is important? There's actually two things that are really critical. Heat transfer as well as surface quality. The first thing with heat transfer is if you've ever done any hand planing or even rubbing your hand over a surface back and forth or when you're sanding, you can notice how your hand gets warm. Or on the bottom of a plane, you can feel that it's getting hot. When we are cutting with a router bit, we are creating a lot of friction. Therefore, we're creating a lot of heat energy. What we want to do with that heat energy is we want to transfer it to the chip as opposed to the tool. When it's transferred to the chip, we reduce the heating of the tool, and as the tool heats up, 
a couple of things happen. When it gets too hot, we start to run eccentric. So as a bit gets hot, the collet gets hot, the spindle gets warm, we're not running in a true center anymore. And it can cause excess wear in the spindle and the collets that we talked about last time. So primarily, we want to make sure that the heat is transferred to the chip and not the spindle. The problem with the heat getting transferred to the spindle is it causes a couple of things. Excess wear on the spindle and the bearings. As the, the heat gets increased, especially when you're doing long cuts, like if you're doing a carving, your bit is in contact quite often or quite frequently for long periods of time. So we don't want the heat going into the tool and causing it to run eccentric. The proper chip load will allow some heat to get transferred into the spindle or the tool, but we want the majority of the chip to take the, to gain that excess heat and remove it from the cutting area. One of the problems that when we have excess heat going into the tool, you may notice that you get resin buildup on the back side of the tool. In another video, we'll talk about clearance angles and gullet shapes for tools that help reduce the buildup of resins and things on the back edge of the cutting uh, edge. If you get a lot of buildup of resin due to heat, your clearance angle on your cutter actually changes. As it changes, you're actually bringing more, constantly bringing more heat into the cutting edge. The other big part of having a proper chip load is surface quality. We want to make sure that we have as good a surface quality as we can possibly have because everybody doesn't, not everybody likes sanding. And having a proper edge finish will reduce the amount of sanding that we need to do. That's only one part of that. And later on we'll talk about why, how to actually make your edge quality better based on the diameter of your tool that you're using. Okay, so here's the hard data that's almost impossible to find on the internet. From the, I, and these chip load numbers are from an industrial perspective. We may or may not be able to achieve those on a hobby type router, CNC router. In woodworking, th these would be what's referred to as industry standards. And to be quite honest, most of the in industry can't find these or use these anyway. Now some of these may be hard to achieve on a hobby CNC machine, but we want to try to get as close as possible to these. So I have two different chip loads here. So we talked about that mean thickness of the chip and how that chip is wedge shaped. We want to take the middle thickness of it. For furniture finish, it's 0 0.012 of an inch to 0 0.032 of an inch. This will give us good surface quality. It will transfer heat to the chip and not to the spindle. Not to say that it won't happen because these are just guidelines. Now with the mill finish of 0 0.032 to 0 0.1 of an inch, this is generally for two by fours coming from a mill that would actually have a higher moisture content in the material as well. You can actually see the surface quality and the finish quality of a two by four versus a piece of furniture. So this we don't want to use because we get, we're going to have tons of sanding to do. This is what we're trying to achieve as close as possible. Okay. There's two main calculations when we're trying to determine chip loads as well as feed speeds because the two come hand, go hand in hand. Now with the two calculations that I put on the board here, we have 
a couple of common elements in here. The feed rate, which is usually in inches per minute, the RPM of the cutter, or how fast we're running, and the number of cutting edge. And you can see that's what's on both of these formulas, with the exception of the one on the bottom, we have chip load. Now that you know the chip load, 0.012 to 0.032, this calculation up here, you tend not to use only because you have to keep redoing the calculation until you find the correct chip load. So we, in the first one, we have inches per minute for the feed rate that your router spindle is moving linearly. We have the RPM of the cutter head times the number of cutting edges. If we fill in these blanks, what we think we want to run at, this will give us the chip load, but the problem is it may be too high or it may be too low. Knowing what our chip load should be, we want to use this calculation. This will give us the feed rate. So we can just give it an arbitrary RPM, give it the chip load, and normally what I'd suggest is pick somewhere in the middle of that range and the number of cutting edges. Because this will give you this times this times this will actually give us our feed speed in inches per minute. So this one on the top kind of goes away because we're probably going to have to do that a half a dozen times based on what our end result is. When we are using this formula, it's easier than the formula up here so that we don't have to keep doing it over and over again to get to the right number. The issue here that you may find is your feed rate may, given here, may exceed the limits of your machine. So there's certain things that we can do to increase our chip, chip load and have a lower feed rate. One of them is to lower the RPM. This, what this does, it's kind of counterintuitive, but if we can't achieve the proper feed rate, we need to lower our RPM. I always like to have a higher feed rate because it's easier to dial down that feed rate. Some machines may have a potentiometer where you can control the feed rate the other thing with the RPM is you're going to have to look at your router and what the manufacturer suggestions are because some of them will have a variable speed. You may have a router that can go to 24,000 revolutions per minute, but the potentiometer for the actual router speed may only have a scale up to six. So that would mean that every one would be What's that? Four, 4,000 RPM. Okay. So you need to make sure that you know what your manufacturer's router is, is capable of maximum speed and what the actual potentiometer actually says that speed is. So when we do this, we want to make sure that we can control the RPM. Some fixed routers, you're going to have issues with if you can't control the speed. So variable speed routers are the way to go on these machines because we can control the RPM. I always put lines through my zeros too nice. because when you're doing CAD stuff and formula stuff using 3D modeling, it's very, that's a zero, not a O, okay. right? Yeah. So. I've always done it. And same with sevens, I always put a line through the middle so, you so it yeah. doesn't do like a one, right? Okay, so here is an example of using this calculation here at the bottom. 18,000 would be our revolutions per minute. Chip load, 0 0.012. The number of cutting edges is two. This will give us if we multiply all those together, we will end up with 432 inches per minute. Some machines, or you may work with your machine in inches per minute for feed rate. 
you may want to go to feet per minute if your machine works that way. So you would take this number divided by 12 to get 36 feet per minute. If we find after we do the calculations that our chip load doesn't fall within the range. If our chip load is too small we want and we need to increase it, there's three ways we can do that. We can increase the feed rate, we can decrease the RPM, and we can use a tool that has less cutting edges. If we find that our chip load is too large, we need to decrease the chip load. We can decrease the feed rate, increase the RPM, or use a tool that has more cutting edges on it. What we're gonna talk about now is knife marks per inch. Because we have a tool that's being rotated and our feed being linear, we don't actually have a flat surface. Unlike a hand plane where we would have a flat surface, what we have is what's called a series of peaks and valleys, which create a knife mark. These knife marks are peaks and valleys. In woodworking, with these peaks and valleys in the knife marks per inch, which is a, a standard unit of measure. If you're not really sure what your knife marks per inch are, the easiest way to find out is if you have some chalk and you rub it on the surface and then lightly rub it off, you will see that the chalk will land and all, you'll wipe the chalk off on all the peaks of the knife marks. And you can actually measure how many of those are within one inch. When we have these peaks and valleys, because we have the rotary tool moving with a linear feed, and we talked about the chip load and the shape of that chip, basically what we have is the peak and the valley. So we have a height difference. So normally, and these are very, very, small distances, but they're large enough that you will have to do more sanding. Ideally, proper sanding requires you to take away all the peaks to come down to the valley. This will allow you to have proper finishing, finishing adhesion, and just an overall appearance. So with these peaks and valleys, we can eliminate a lot of the sanding by having eliminating the distance between the peak and the valley. One of the easiest ways to do this is by the diameter of your tool that you're using. You can use a tool an eighth inch or you can use a tool that is a quarter inch and again not the scale. By using a larger diameter tool, we should end up with the same number of knife marks per inch if we're using the same number of cutting edges on the tool. But because we're using a larger diameter tool, we will have shallower peaks and valleys versus this. So what actually happens is the distance between the peak and the valley decreases, which means less sanding. Less sanding is always good. Now, the other benefit of having a larger tool diameter, besides the fact that we have shallower peaks and valleys, is the exit angle of the tool. So let's say that we have an eighth inch tool here and we have a quarter inch tool here and we're taking an equal amount of material off. Earlier we mentioned that wood is an elastic solid so it tends to stretch before it's cut. If this is turning and cutting, the exit angle of that tooth versus the face is at a large angle. 
Where if we had a larger diameter cutter, taking the same amount of material off, the exit angle of the tooth is less severe. So what we want with this, we will find that we will get less fracturing in here. I'm sure when you're doing any edge cutting, you may see large cracks develop as you're cutting. That's because the exit angle here is actually pulling these fibers this way as it's cutting. And you may get large amounts of tear out on that edge. Whereas if we had a less severe cutting angle, we do less pulling on the edge here so that we end up with a cleaner surface. Okay, as we finish up today, tip of the day, when you're working with curly material or figured material and you find that you're getting a lot of tear out on the surface, there's two ways we can counteract that. Now, and let's talk about planing as the one reason why we get tear out on the surface. So if you're planing material and you're getting lots of tear out, the simplest thing to do is don't put the material in the planer straight on. Put it in on an angle, tip to tip, so that the cutting action is actually shearing across the grain. If you find that you still get some tear out, besides replacing your knives, what I like to do is just take a spray bottle and put a little bit of moisture on the surface, wipe most of it off when we just, you can just see that the water is just on the surface. When you plane this, the cells kind of soften up and become more pliable so that it's easier to cut. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you like the content and you want to see more, please like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next one.